to Gun Speaking. I'm calling from the other side of the world. So just a very brief update. Um, we're a reminder to check out the Volpe views. His next talk is on preterm infants who need their sleep, especially act active sleep. There is an open call for nominations for NBC, the NBS leadership and committees. Uh, if you're interested in serving, uh, then then this is this is the way to apply. Next, we want to remind you about the NBS webinar teaching modules. There are new courses on neonatal neuroprotection, which are available through through Think Five for the NBS members. Uh, the next webinar uh, on in April is on neuroimaging beyond neurofrid spectroscopy development of diffuse optical tomography to image the newborn brain from Turpin Austin, I believe, uh, from Cambridge in the UK. There's a <clears throat> following that. There's a MBS trainee webinar on neonatal neurological examination, and finally, uh, there there's the, uh, the 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 webinar on brain imaging and development. I'm good. Uh, might uh, might my chair. Next, a reminder of the NBS meet and greet uh, breakfast at PAS this this year. An exclusive networking opportunity, including a prestigious ceremony to honor uh, myself, in fact. Yay! I mean, what what could be better? It starts at 6.30 a.m. This is this really is the time. Um, the last time I discussed this, Mohammed, I, I believe that is because uh, MBS counts as, as the newbies. So we're <clears throat> so we get the slots that nobody else wants to have at eight at 6.30 a.m. sharp. On the, on the Saturday at the Inter Intercontinental. If you want to IVSP, you can IVSP here. Thank you. The, the NBS has one-stop access to resources with focus on neonatal and perinatal, perinatal neurology. So keep, keep in mind uh, that these resources are available to you. So finally, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Chris Lear. Chris was our PhD student in the in the <coughs> neonatal neurology and phys physiology group. So he completed his PhD, followed by a training training in medicine. I believe in American terms, he's now a, now an intern in New Zealand. This this means he's a, he, he is a he, he is a uh, he is a house he is now a house officer. The impressive thing is he's managed to continue significant research during his medical training. Uh, as everybody knows, we, we do large animal research, and he's going to present some of that work to us today. Chris, over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Alistair, for that introduction. I'll just get my slides working. All right, hopefully everyone can see that now. Um, so yeah, thanks for the introduction. So as Alistair said, I'm a, um, a senior research fellow in his group actually, and I'm also a junior doctor, um, which is just across the road from our lab in Auckland. Um, and today I'm going to be um, talking about some of our work looking at the tertiary evolution of white matter injury and some quite striking findings that we've um, noticed in the changes in circadian patterns that we see um, after this type of injury. So yeah, we're the, uh, from the Fetal Physiology and Neuroscience group um, run by Professor Laura Bennett and Alistair Gunn. Alistair Gunn obviously needs no introduction to this group. Um, so we're, our group is interested in the fetal responses and adaptation to hypoxia and infection. Um, we study the patterns and mechanisms of brain injury, look for treatments, and we also are very interested in looking for biomarkers to predict um, injury. So the talk today, I'm going to talk about the tertiary evolution of um, and mechanisms of preterm white matter injury, followed by looking at circadian disruptions in EEG and also cardiovascular 
um, outcomes focusing on heart rate variability. So this is our um, our group in Auckland, along with all our partners and families. So we're quite a large group. Um, so hypoxia ischemia at preterm gestation um, in relation to the rates of 1.5 per thousand term births, preterms have a much higher rate of HIE. Um, and we also know that they tend to have a greater burden of antenatal rather than intrapartum events contributing to this. And we know that antenatal HI contributes to both HIE and preterm born neonates, as well as still sorry, stillbirth um, and established brain injury in term born infants. Um, we describe we generally describe two patterns of white matter injury in preterm humans. We have the diffuse um, white matter injury, which is characterized by oligodendrocyte maturation or rest, reactive gliosis, and myelin def deficits. And then the more severe form of injury, the cystic white matter injury, which occurs in a much smaller percentage, um, um, but is associated with pancellular loss, um, and tends to be only seen on cranial ultrasound at three to five weeks after birth. Um, so there's actually quite a lot of time between birth where, and the timing of injury and when we start to see these cystic lesions. We also know that the rates of cystic um, white matter injury is generally falling, um, which has been seen in multiple cohorts across the world, but it still remains heavily associated with cerebral palsy, um, with this paper suggesting it had a 65% odds ratio, uh, sorry, 65-fold odds ratio for developing cerebral palsy. Everyone here will also be well aware that hypoxic cell death is a delayed evolutionary process, such that the um, primary cell death during HI itself is actually minimal, with majority of cells recovering their metabolic um, function and metabolism um, in the latent phase, lasting until about six hours after injury. And the majority of cells actually die during the secondary phase of injury between six to seven, 72 hours afterwards. And we know that the severity of that secondary cell loss um, is associated with the severity of neurodevelopmental um, disability in term humans. And we can see that here, this is cytochrome oxidase measured using near infrared spectroscopy. You can see in the black group that injury occurred here and over 72 hours, we see a progressive loss in cytochrome oxidase activity. Um, so just briefly, um, I'm sure everyone here will be very familiar with hypoxic, hypoxia ischemia sets up a, a cascade of injurious factors that propagate through the latent phase into the secondary phase, including inflammation, astrogliosis, loss of trophic factors, calcium overload, and all this um, establishes and propagates pro-apoptotic cascades, leading to widespread secondary cell death. After 72, to hour, 72 hours, though, we... Um, have relatively poor understanding of the events during this phase and how this ultimately um, evolves into the patterns of injury that we see clinically, the diffuse white matter injury and the cystic white matter injury. Generally, we think of this phase as being um, important, being characterized by a degree of repair and regeneration, but continuing stored maturation and neuroinflammation. Um, so I'm going to now introduce you to our our model. Um, so we do all our experiments in the chronically instrumented fetal sheep. In this talk, I'm talking about the preterm fetal sheep, although we do work at term gestation as well. So in this model, we take a pregnant sheep to surgery and under sterile conditions, we expose the uterus and partially exteriorize the fetal sheep. So this is a preterm fetal sheep looking rather alien-like, not really like a lamb that you would expect. Um, but once we have it exteriorized, um, we then implant a wide variety of catheters um, and other instruments, including flow probes to measure um, blood flow to both the brain and the periphery. And we also place um, electrodes to measure multiple physiological parameters. These are the 
um, neon free spectroscopy probes that we sometimes place. And important for a lot of our work is this umbilical cord occluded that we place around the umbilical cord, which we can later inflate to cause hypoxia. The end of surgery, put the feds back in the uterus, use back in the U. We wake the sheep up and we allow four to five days for anesthetics to clear and for both sheep and fetus to recover. And at the end of this process, we're monitoring a healthy fetal sheep developing in real time and we can get second by second data. So this is raw EEG activity um, and this is raw e ECG activity and blood pressure. And we can record this for many hours um, and days. So this is across 88 hours, but we routinely will record for um, up to four weeks. So um, the first study I'm going to show you is um, work that I was doing and also my my younger brother, Ben Lear. You'll see his name flashing up in quite a lot of these um, slides. So it's been a joint work between him and, him and I and also, of course, many other people um, in the lab. Um, but so the first study I'm going to show you is us trying to establish the timeline of events during the sec during the tertiary phase of injury. So four to five days after surgery, we then induce um, severe hypoxia ischemia by completely inflating that umbilical cord occluder for 25 minutes, which is a near terminal insult. The end of that period, we then release the occluder and allow the fetus to um, reperfuse, and we then study the fetus the fetuses for um for up to 21 days so in this study we had serial put downs at three days which is after the end of the secondary phase so most of our understanding suggests that this is when the maximum extent of brain injury has been reached um, we then had further put downs at 7 14 and 21 days and we had of course, some um, controls that did not have hypoxia ischemia. And this takes us up to um, 125 days um, gestational age, which is equivalent to term equivalent age in terms of brain maturity. So what we saw was that um, white matter injury continued to evolve over the tertiary phase so over this three week period. So initially at three, seven and 14 days, um, the injury um, was consistent with diffuse white matter injury, which we observed in both the parietal and the temporal lobes. But then at 21 days, this transitioned to a pattern of both diffuse and cystic white matter injury. So diffuse injury, we still saw um, in the parietal lobe. However, in the temporal lobe, um, we saw severe cystic injury. I'm just going to firstly focus on the diffuse white matter injury. Um, so looking at um, the parietal lobes and also a perilesion area, which is outside the, um, just on the border of the cystic white matter injury, what we observed was ongoing maturation or rest of oligodendrocytes, which you can see here with CC1. So this data is um, showing you day three, seven, 14, 21, across three par um, parietal lobe re regions and then the perilegion region. Um, so Acutely, we saw a loss of total numbers of oligodendrocytes, which then recovered back to sham control levels. However, we saw persisting um, maturation or rest of oligodendrocytes. Strikingly, though, we actually saw that um, myelin proteins, so IBA1 and also CMPAs, actually recovered quite well in these regions. So by the end of 21 days, we saw no difference in the area fraction of these proteins. Um, and actually, when we looked morphologically, um, we saw quite good myelin um, characteristics in these um, in these areas. So even though we saw maturational rest of the oligodendrocytes, those that were there actually seem to be doing a good job, although we of course don't know if that would have continued on into you know past 21 days or if we might have seen a later deficit. When we looked at microglia, so um, immune cells, we saw um, that we had persisting high numbers throughout the three week period in both the parietal and temporal lobes. But we also saw that the um, 
that in the parietal lobe they had returned to a ramified resting appearance, whereas they remained amoeboid, which is an activated um, phenotype in the temporal lobe. So looking now at the cystic white matter injury in the temporal lobe, um, so across three to 21 days, so this is only showing you the temporal lobe, you can see that between three and seven days and 14 days, this tissue um, is still structurally intact, although there is clearly something going on in 14 days. And then by 21 days, we see this um, complete loss of uh, white matter here. What we also observed at 21 days is that there was a spectrum of injury across our group. So we saw some fetuses that um, developed no cystic lesions. Um, so they were only characterized by diffuse white matter injury. We then had the ones that developed these overt cystic lesions. And then the most severely injured fetuses um, were ones which developed severe white matter atrophy. And what we think was happening here is that they showed earlier um, appearance of cystic white matter injury, which then later collapsed in on themselves. Um, so the looking at these um, cystic lesions under the microscope, in general, they um, we can see that there was complete loss of white matter area, including myelin staining here. Um, and around the borders of the cystic lesion, there was quite abnormal myelin staining as well. We saw high numbers of um, microglia and astrocytes, which were all quite densely stained. Um, and, so, and we also saw a ring of um, um, activated uh, astrocytes and microglia surrounding the cystic lesions. Um, it is also note at this point that the timing that we see these cystic lesions is also quite similar to the timing that we observe in human preterms via uh, cranial ultrasound. When we looked at the um, the histological changes that preceded the cystic white matter injury in the temporal lobe. Um, so there's the same images I showed you before. Um, so in these graphs, um, day three, seven, and 14 is shown across the graphs in this direction now. Um, and what we observed is that the glia cells, so both the oligodendrocytes, the total numbers and the mature numbers up to 14 days, as well as astrocytes up to 14 days in the central of the temporal lobe were actually still alive at three, seven and 14 days, um, which was really suggesting that there was a wave of cell death, which was occurring after 14 days, leading to these cystic lesions at 21 days. So Naturally, we started wondering if we if we were would, would be able to save these cells and stop them going on to um, widespread cell death and forming these cystic lesions. What we also notice is that the the location of these cystic lesions at 21 days were predicted by where we saw microglia aggregates at earlier time points, so all the way back at day three, um, and we saw this. And importantly, we saw this in our control tissue. So what it appears is that where we see these large groups of um, microglia, which we know are developmentally important structures for the guiding of axons um, uh, through the white matter, predicted where we would see the lesions. And that is... And those lesions, sorry, those microglia aggregates were there at the time of hypoxia ischemia. So what we think is happening is that there was initial activation of these microglia aggregates within the first three days of injury, which then seemed to settle down between day seven and 14 days and were then further activated um, between day 14 and 21 day leading to intense neuroinflammation and potentially triggering um, widespread cell death. And looking at the, the phenotype, well, the, um, morph the histological characteristics of the cystic lesions and the timing of it, it is quite reminiscent of programmed necrosis, um, which I'm sure 
people here will be well familiar with Frances Norvington's work, um, where she has shown in, in neonatal rats that there is a quite delayed wave of programmed necrosis happening um, well after hypoxia ischemia, which can be blocked with early treatment with necrostatin. And you can see here um, in the control group here, it, that there is quite a delayed development of the cystic white matter, sorry, cystic injury here, but that is markedly reduced when she gave um, necrostatin early after the injury. So program necrosis is, um, it's a regulated form of cell death. So it's not the classical necrosis that we tend to talk about. So it's sort of a blend between um, apoptosis and and um, necrosis. So, um, oh, sorry, I should have pointed out that. So, one of the key um, initiators of this in, of program necrosis is tumor necrosis factor. So, what we then went on to do was to um, give a tanacept, which is a TNF blocker. So, this is a similar um, study designed to to before with 25 minutes of hypoxia ischemia. Um, and then what we did was to give a tanacept at days three, eight, and 13 days. And we gave one milligram um, of a tanacept. And we infused this straight into the lateral ventricle through an ICV catheter. Um, so importantly, the first dose of etanacept was given at the end of the secondary phase. So again, where classically we would um, think that most cell death has already occurred at this point. Um, so it is really um, trying to demonstrate that um, there is still this later wave of cell death. We then um, did our postmortems on day 21. And what we observed was that we did, in fact, see quite marked protection against cystic injury. So we have the control group, the um, UCO vehicle group, and the UCO um, atanacep group. Sorry, uh, UCO um, just stands for umbilical cord occlusion. Um, and what we what you can see here in both um, MBP, so myelin stained um, slides, and also IBA1, so microglia stained slide, is quite um, impressive protection against the cystic lesions compared to the vehicle group. What we what we also noticed was that we saw complete ipsilateral protection. So we put our um, our etanacept into one of the lateral ventricles. And on that side, we, we never saw any um, cystic lesions. However, on the other side of the brain, the other hemisphere, we, we still saw um, the appearance of smaller um, cystic lesions. So we saw partial contralateral protection. We also saw that um, etanacept protected against microscopic white matter injury in the temporal lobes. So both um, in the center of the temporal lobe and in the periphery of the temporal lobe, we saw improved numbers of total oligodendrocytes compared to UCO vehicle group. And we also saw an increase in the numbers of mature oligodendrocytes in the, um, in the, temporal white matter 2 region, which is in the periphery. We did, however, still see persisting um, impairment of oligodendrocytes, oligodendrocyte maturation in the center, which is the most severely injured region. This was also followed up by improvements in the area fraction of myelin basic protein as well. We did, however, still see some deficits in CMPAs, which is a smaller component of um, myelin. And when we looked morphologically at this myelin staining, um, we can see that it was quite irregular and sparsely stained um, in the vehicle group. But in the UC, uh, the Atanasep group, you can see that this morphology is much closer to the control group. So we did have quite good um, recovery of myelin after a tenancy treatment. Furthermore, we saw improvement in the parietal lobe um, in diffuse white matter injury. So no change in the total numbers of 
a League of Dangerous sites, um, but there was no change. Um, we see we still see that nice restorative response um, of the pre OLs. We um, also saw that the numbers of mature ligodendrocytes in the parietal lobe were restored back to control levels. Um, and again, we still see good recovery of MVP, which we see in the um, in the control group as well. Um, so the take home from these two studies is that um, there is, is that delayed neuroinflammation is crucial in the pathology in both diffuse and cystic white matter injury after hypoxia ischemia in the preterm brain. Um, Etanacet was able to improve outcomes for, for both of these types of injury. Um, and this demonstrates that there is actually substantial white matter injury after the closure of the secondary phase of injury, suggesting that there is actually potentially quite a wide therapeutic window where we may be able to improve at least some components of preterm brain injury. Um, so we've sort of filled in a bit of what is kind of happening during the tertiary phase of injury. So after the secondary, the wave of secondary cell death, there is persisting um, neuroinflammation. And um, at least in this severe model of um, HI, it appears that we get a later excessive increase in neuroinflammation, which then triggers program necrosis, giving us um, tertiary cell death. And this, um, if severe, then leads to cystic white matter injury and ventricular megaly. Of course, we still have the ongoing um, oligodendrocyte maturational arrests with impaired myelination, um, which then, of course, will contribute to impaired connectivity and white matter atrophy. Um, I will point out that, so I've been... I've been focusing on the white matter outcomes. Of course, we also see quite severe um, gray matter changes um, after in preterm humans and also in our models of preterm hypoxia ischemia. Um, so Ben has also been characterizing uh, the gray matter changes. And what, we, what we've seen so far is that um, we have early hippocampal injury that is established at three days um, and does not recover by 21 days. Um, while we see delayed cortical injury without cell loss at 21 days of injury. So there is definitely, although it looks like we may be able to save um, some of the white matter with quite a long therapeutic window, there is obviously other injury that will have been completed by three days. So ultimately we're going to need a multimodal approach to um, being able to improve um, brain injury across different um sites in the brain and those may well have to be given those treatments may well have to be given at different points in the evolution of injury so it appears that we um at least when we're talking about white matter that um that there may well be this wider window of opportunity where we may be able to treat. But of course, if we're able to treat, we're going to need to be able to identify infants with um, injury in a time in a time frame when we can still treat. So um, we have been interested in how we can better develop biomarkers um, for this injury. Um, and obviously, EEG activity, brain activity, is always an attractive um, uh, method to identify brain injury in, in preterm humans. Um, and we know already from work done in the in the 90s and early 2000s that humans with cystic white matter injuries do have EEG changes. There is um, broadly described both acute changes, which is characterized by suppression of the EEG, as well as chronic changes to the EEG, um, which tend to be more about disordered um, sleep state um, and overall architecture, architecture of the EEG. So I'm going to now show you the EEG results from these animals with three weeks recovery. And then after that, um, I'm going to show you our results looking at heart rate monitoring, 
um, in these animals as well, both of which um, we have published recently. Um, and the attractive thing about heart rate monitoring, of course, is that it may have utility both before and after birth for identifying injured um, neonates or fetuses. Um, so to start with, um, circadian rhythms are going to be quite important for this discussion. So circadian rhythms, just as a bit of a background, they represent the interplay between the central clock, which is located in the SCN in the brain, as well, um, which interact with the peripheral clocks of the body. For example, there is an important peripheral clock in the heart. Um, fetal circadian rhythms are entrained by maternal melatonin, um, which is able to pass freely through the placenta. However, we still have quite poor understanding of um, fetal circadian rhythms. They have been described, however, in humans from um, as early as 20 weeks. It, broadly, fetuses are more active at night, um, and we also know that circadian patterns are important in regulating our immune, um, immune and inflammatory functions, um, which may well have relevance to when we um, to um, inflammatory forms of cell death, such as program necrosis. And I'll also point out that there are also ultradian rhythms present, which include sleep state um, and also changes in, in uh, fetal behavior. So very similar study design um, here using 25 minutes of complete umbilical cord occlusion and um, following fetuses for 21 days, which takes us from preterm equivalent up to term equivalent. And over this recovery period, um, we've continuously recorded EEG um, activity as well as fetal heart rate variability. Um, over this time, we start to see sleep state um, appear at about 14 days after occlusion. And I did um, in-depth sleep state analysis over the final, um, final day of recovery. So this is the overall results. These, this is from a single fetus in our control group. We've got EEG power and spectral edge frequency um, from the baseline day um, and then through until 21 days after occlusion. And you can see that there's a progressive increase in EEG power and a progressive fall in spectral edge frequency. So over this time, we're transitioning from an immature um, EEG activity characterized by um, dis it's, um, a discontinuous mixed frequency EEG up until term equivalent age um, at 21 days, where we now have the appearance of sleep state cycling with low voltage, high frequency activity here and high voltage, low frequency activity here. Um, I'm firstly going to show you some what is an indirect view of looking at the development of sleep state. Um, so this is uh, uh, similar. Well, this is ba this is um, a method done by Sato in the past. Um, so what I've done is to batch up all the spectral edge frequencies across a 24-hour period and. Um, create a frequency distribution of this. So if we look at day one, you can see that there is a unimodal distribution of spectral edge frequencies um, with predominant activity in high frequency um, and yeah, in high frequency. By 21 days, we have now shifted from the unimodal distribution to a bimodal distribution characterized by this low frequency low voltage, high frequency state um, and the high voltage, low frequency state that you can see here. And now this is the, um, the UCO group. And what you can see is that there is that EEG activity is grossly different compared to control fetuses. So you can see that there is this early period of high amplitude um, seizure activity with progressive recover recovery after that. Um, 
but you can see that there is a remaining deficit in EEG power here compared to the control group. We see a progressive increase in spectral edge frequency, but then we do not see this sort of tush, this um, final fall in spectral edge frequency that we see in um, the control group. And what we appear to be missing is the high amplitude, high power, low frequency activity, which is characteristic of um, non-REM sleep. And when we look at the distribution of this, um, sort of indirectly looking at the sleep state, we can see that we start in both groups with unimodal distribution out on the baseline period. And with time, we can see that the control group in white progressively shifts to this sort of bimodal distribution, but this is impaired in the UCO group with a greater, a persisting greater high frequency activity throughout. So I then um, hopefully the this bar is not obscuring your screen. Um, I can't seem to. I'm not quite sure how to get rid of it. Um, but I then did um, more in-depth analysis of sleep start on the final 24 hours of recovery. Um, so I did this from 6 a.m. to 6 a.m. on the final day of the experiment, and I visually identify reciprocal changes in both EEG power and spectral edge frequency. So I was looking for um, periods of high voltage, low frequency activity seen here, which is broadly equivalent to non-REM sleep and periods of low voltage, high frequency activity, which is broadly equivalent to REM sleep. And I was looking for um, states, um, a stable state lasting at least three minutes in duration. And for this experiment, I did not assign any threshold values that needed to be met other than the, the need for, um, for there to be reciprocal changes and for their and for the state to last longer than three minutes. Um, and all other periods of time, I class as indeterminate sleep. So this is just the overall um, sleep state outcomes, but sleep state will keep coming back in over the next few slides. What we what I observed is that there was overall a decreased um, percentage time on that final day of recovery spent in high voltage sleep that you can see here. Um, yeah, so sorry, a decreased amount of time in high voltage sleep and a increase in the amount of time spent in low voltage sleep. This was not driven by changes in the number of the sleep states. Um, but was driven by a shorter average time spent in high voltage sleep and a corresponding um, increase in the duration spent in low voltage state. Um, so it's not about the a change in the numbers. It's purely that they was once they flicked into high voltage sleep, they only remained there for a shorter period of time before flicking back to low voltage sleep. So now this is the overall group data for EEG outcomes. So total EEG power, spectral edge frequency, and this is nuchal EMG activity. So this is a measure of muscle activity as an index of fetal body movements. Um, and this is the corresponding sleep, sleep states um, data on the final day of recovery. So what we see is over the 21 day period, we see persisting loss of total EEG power and we see a persistent increase in nuclear EMG activity, which is likely reflecting spasticity. Um, with spectral edge frequency, we see an early shift to low frequency activity, but over the final three days, we saw a shift to higher frequency activity. And what we can see in here is that there is a daily, the, there is this um, daily triphasic pattern that we see. So characterized by this early morning dip followed by um, a mid-morning initial smaller amplitude peak followed by a greater evening peak. And this pattern is not seen in the control group in black. Um, 
when we looked at sleep state, we saw that um, in both sleep states, we saw an impairment in total EEG power. And we saw that in high voltage sleep, spectral edge frequency was increased in the in the um, injured groups. So they were unable to reduce the frequency of their um, of their EEG appropriately in um, high voltage sleep. When I've then gone and looked at so spectral EEG powers, what we see is that there is a persisting loss of um, EEG power in low frequency bands, so both delta and theta activity. There was an early loss in high frequency activity um, for the first two weeks across alpha and beta power, but this recovered to control levels by the final week of recovery. Um, I'm just going to skip over the sleep state outcomes here. Um, it's difficult to appreciate here, but we still see the same triphasic circadian patterns, but they're more clear here. So this is the proportion of power in each of the bands, so delta, theta, alpha, and beta. So again, so we saw an early increase in delta activity and a late fall in delta activity. Um, along with early decreases in alpha and beta proportion, but later increases in this high frequency activity. And you can see much clearly here, this again, triphasic circadian pattern and a corresponding um, opposite pattern in the low frequency activity. So it's illustrating that there is this um, daily rhythmic shift, shift to high frequency activity. What we broadly saw across all these outcomes was that um, the worse the severity of the brain injury measured by both um, white matter, thalamic and thalamic area, um, and also lateral ventricle area, um, were all broadly correlated with er worse EEG outcomes. And quite interestingly, actually, the area of the lateral ventricle was the most strongly associated with worse outcomes. And that's most likely I'm um, just reflecting that this is a better surrogate in um, in our tissue of the overall severity of injury. The most striking finding that we saw in these in this group, however, was that there was this daily loss of sleep state cycling. So here is a control group, um, a control animal across the 24 hour um, of the final day, and you see nice stable um, sleep state cycling. However, the UCO group, every all of these fetuses all abruptly stop sleep state cycling at approximately 6 to 7 p.m., on average at 7 p.m. Um, and this lasted nearly three hours in these fetuses. And if you look here with the arrows, we can see evidence that this was happening over the final five days of recovery. And this um, quite interestingly corresponds broadly with when the lights in our lab go off at night at 6 p.m. When we looked more closely, um, what we saw was that there was this period of disruption was associated with increased nuchal EMG activity. So it looked like tonic EEG act uh, EMG activity, as well as this rhythmic increase in high frequency activity. Um, what is further interesting is that sleep state cycling starts occurring at about 14 days of recovery, but we can see evidence that this high frequency activity is actually starting earlier um, before sleep state cycling. So from this, we, we are wondering whether this represents high frequency um, epileptiform transients um, and whether this may be um, disrupting sleep state architecture. We're also wondering if this may represent a precursor to a severe epileptic synd syndrome. Um, in a previous study, um, I'm just I, well aware I'm probably starting to run out of time, so I'm going to start going moving through a bit more um, 
with a bit more pace. Um, in a previous study, I, um, I showed that hyperglycemia at the time of hypoxia ischemia markedly worsened um, injury. So we observed quite severe cystic injury and quite heavy thalamic injury um, in hyperglycemic fetuses. And in this study, I also observed a increase in um, circadian and um, an increase in this, uh, sorry, an exacerbation of circadian patterns and EEG activity. So in this study, I the I was wondering whether sort of the complete destruction of circadian pattern generators. Um, effectively uncovered a rudimentary but high amplitude rhythm, possibly something as simple as cortisol, which may have been um, leading to this um, increase um, circadian patterns. So in the present study, I we're wondering whether partial destruction along with dysfunction of some pattern generation, generators is what is generating this increased circadian pattern. So quickly, I'm just going to show you our fetal heart rate variability findings. So this is an overlapping cohort. And, and I did this work with a Japanese obstetrician, Yoshiki Maida. Um, so when we look at heart rate variability, we do look at time domain and frequency domain analysis. And in this study, we looked at low, very low frequency, low frequency and high frequency activity, as well as very high frequency activity, which is quite unique to sort of fetuses. Um, when we looked at fetal heart rate across this period of time, um, we saw largely no difference. What we saw with simple um, heart rate variability measures, we saw initial suppression early after injury um, with later good recovery of heart rate variability. But what we saw was an exaggeration of the um, circadian pattern um, such that they saw, we saw deeper nadirs in heart rate variability during the morning, but this returned to control levels by the evening. When we looked at frequency domain analysis, we saw basically the same pattern with early suppression across all our frequency bands with a degree of um, recovery towards, um, towards 21 days with low frequency and very low frequency showing persisting changes out at 21 days. But again, we saw this exaggeration of the circadian pattern with a um, greater a deepen the deer in heart rate variability during the morning with a um, but then they returned to um, control levels by um, the evening. This is a horrible table and I made this so I do apologize for it but I'm just going to walk people through it very quickly. So across multiple of these parameters we saw that the nadir in fetal heart rate variability was lower in the morning. Some of these nadirs were also significantly delayed compared to the control um, fetuses. The evening peaks, though, were largely unchanged, so they returned to that control level, and we saw no change in the timing of the peak. And what this led to was a greater peak-to-peak um, -peak amplitude in these parameters. So what we observed overall was that injured fetuses had lower heart rate variability in the morning with normalization of heart rate variability towards um, control levels in the evening. And this is just some preliminary data from Ben again, um, looking at the brainstem. Um, and what we can see is, at least in this fetus, quite severe destruction of the medullary centers. Um, but we also do see a similar spectrum of injury um, so with less injured and, um, brain stems and more heavily injured brain stems. And this, um, this must be contributing to some of the changes that we see in heart rate variability, but there is a lot more work to um, do to characterize this. So if we compare our forebrain and hindbrain activity, so EEG from the forebrain and heart rate variability from the hindbrain, we actually see different circadian disruption. So the forebrain EEG, we see abnormal, they are abnormal in the evening with loss of sleep state cycling. And they also show this complex triphasic pattern. What's also interesting is that um, the circadian disruption 
occurs quite late. Um, so it looks like these patterns are still developing up to 21 days. When we look at hindbrain though, we see that they were abnormal in the morning, not in the evening. And they showed a simpler biphasic pattern with just a morning trough and evening peak. This, however, appeared to occur earlier. So you can see even back here at day nine or so, um, the greater oscillation in circadian um, uh, rhythm was already established. So what we're wondering is, does this reflect later forebrain injury in the forebrain versus earlier hindbrain injury? Um, and this is just to demonstrate that we've got ongoing work to try and understand how we could better use this antenatally um, because before birth, we are unable to measure EEG activity, of course. So how does, does this relate to behavioral state as assessed by fetal heart rate? Um, and as you can see, where in this fetus where I've plotted, where I've calculated both, um, you can see that there is no simple relationship between EEG and heart rate defined sleep state, but I've got ongoing work to try and better understand um, the relationships between this. So on to sort of some quick summaries. So looking at the tertiary evolution of white matter injury, it appears that there is actually a potentially quite a wide window where we could improve white matter, matter outcomes. However, there is still ongoing work needed to understand um, the earlier gray matter injury and which will most likely require early intervention versus potentially early and delayed intervention to improve white matter outcomes. When we look at circadian, the circadian components, um, we um, circadian disruption is a feature of severe HI injury. And we wonder whether this could be a potential biomarker for future trials. We see suppression of circadian patterns acutely. Um, whereas we see exaggeration of the circadian patterns long term. We do, however, see um, system specific disruption. So with EEG, we saw that they their circadian pattern was abnormal predominantly at night, and we saw this later in recovery, whereas heart rate variability, it was abnormal in the morning, with um, and this appeared earlier in recovery. So this suggests that if we used a multi modal approach, um, this may provide two windows during the day where we could identify um, evolving brain injury and may well be able to help us time when injury occurred. Just some final thoughts. Um, so obviously I've run the argument that injury is causing circadian disruption, which it, to a degree it must be, um, but I, it is um, very likely that the circadian disruption that we see here goes on to cause chronic um, circadian disruption. And it is, of course, entirely possible that that may contribute to later disease in life. So I'm left wondering whether chronic circadian disruption, if that is a long term potential therapeutic target. But at the same time, it is possible, considering that the importance that the circadian um, circadian rhythms have in um, controlling and regulating our immune function, it is possible that this acute circadian disruption um, within the first weeks after injury could be contributing to neuroinflammation as well, and therefore contributing to the severity of injury. And so it is possible also that um, treating and modulating circadian patterns acutely might also be a therapeutic target. So with that, I need to thank our fantastic team, including, of course, our, um, our generous funding bodies, Auckland Medical Research Foundation, and also the Health Research Council of New Zealand. And thanks, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you all today, and thanks very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions now. Can I, can I start with one? Um, 
This is Eleanor Malloy. Um, and thanks, Chris. That was the most amazing talk. It was fantastic. Um, I was just going to actually ask some of the questions in the Q&A. Is that OK, Alistair, just to start off with? Please, uh, please. And um, so from Francesca Garcia, how did you decide the dose of your etanercept to inject intraventricularly? And could you talk about the timing choice you made for administration, given the pharmacokinetics delayed onset of action and long half-life? Sorry, that's a long one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, great question. Um, so the dose, um, I extrapolated it from multiple um, previous studies. Um, so I based it on an adult rat study where it was given after um, ischemic injury. I also extrapolated it from um, some human studies as well, not given for um, not given for um, brain injury. Um, and I forgive me, I can't remember exactly what what the setting of that one was for, but across multiple studies, when I extrapolated it back and um, extrapolated it to the weight of a preterm um, sheep brain, it all they all actually came to about suggesting 0.8 milligrams was about the appropriate mm -hmm. dose. Um, so in reality, it was purely a um, it was an educated guess based on what other people had done previously, and it seemed to, in the end, work to be work out to be relatively um, spot on. Although it does appear that we probably underdose to a degree, so <clears throat> although we're probably broadly in the right um, the right um, dose window, um, there's definitely further optimization that needs needs to occur. In terms of timing, so we started at um, 72 hours because we wanted to the secondary phase to be completely finished so that we were only treating tertiary phase um, effects. And um, the timing of five days between mm. was based on... Um, the systemic half-life of etanercept, um, which is approximately 108 hours, um, depending on which resource you read, though. Um, and in reality, it was just an educated guess on the information available, because of course it hadn't been used in such a in a similar setting before. Um, and it just worked out that we managed to. Um, come up with what was quite a sensible sensible window. We additionally approached it thinking that we wanted to just dampen down TNF um, rather than completely knock it out. So we weren't trying to um, uh, give a heavy dose immediately, um, which is why we sort of did the, we went with one milligram, but repeating it three times just to lower the amount because we know that TNF is, of course, also very important in brain developments. And can I extend that question for, sorry, this is very cheeky, but um, uh, I was wondering, because you've just shown some amazing data on circadian rhythm. Would you think that you may have to time your medications related to circadian rhythms? Um, just because we found in babies with baby severe any They've got um, very diff huge changes in their melatonin responses. And for mm. so do you think that's something you'll have to do times with your EEG or will, do you think there's an optimal time or do you think it just doesn't matter because you're suppressing inflammation? Um, well, I think the, the most important thing, of course, is going to be timing from insult. Um, I think that's, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the more important thing to get right, but absolutely as you've said, and as um, as I sort of alluded to, circadian patterns do regulate immune function, so may well so the timing that we give it may well be important. But I suspect that's going to be uh, there will be a lot of work involved to work out to work that out. But yeah, absolutely, it's definitely possible. And um, can I? Ask, this is probably a silly question. Is just to see just for my head relative to human doses, where you'd be giving it to say for someone with inflammatory bowel disease or with rheumatology how do your are your doses kind of very similar in an animal model or are they higher or lower just rough ballpark um excellent question actually and i'm afraid i actually can't remember off the oh, sorry, top of my question. head <laughs> sorry <laughs> no that was a, a but no i was just curious because i suppose when you translate into humans 
which I'm assuming is the next, there's one place you're going to go. It would just, it just makes it easier just to know. That's all. I was curious. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I just can't remember off the top of my head. Sorry. Well, you're coming to now. I'm sorry, Alistair. I should probably let Alistair do the next one, but this is, I have to, I have to tell you this one because you'll both be too modest. Um, the next one is from Gary Howard. And I have, this is a lovely question starting with a compliment. Thank you for the best science I've ever seen on newborn brain. Wow. Um, we use dop dobutamine to stimulate blood flow for overcoming glial hypoxia, which is caused by overactive neurons over consuming oxygen. Dibutamine is phase one of our protocol that fully resolves epilepsy for humans. Dibutamine also far outperforms hypothermia for improving brain blood flow and oxygenation. We would surely like to collaborate with your team using dobutamine to mitigate glial hypoxia and our complete protocol to better quantify neurometabolic reset and myelination. Um, thank you very much for the for for that for the compliments. Um, and that sounds like some very very interesting work as well. Um, I, I I'm sure I speak for Alice, Alistair that um, we're always interested in new ideas and interested in collaborations. Um, I'm afraid dobutamine is far outside of my understanding, so I don't think I can um, comment much further. But yeah, definitely always interested in further collaborations. Alistair, do you have anything to add to that? Not at this time, sorry. Yeah. Well, but, can I say but, something? I think that's amazing and it makes me feel uh, foolish because in neonatology, that's we use these drugs all the time to improve blood flow to brain and so on. So I think it's really interesting. But I think dobutamine probably has some other extra cardiac effects as well, which would be very interesting um, in your model. Mm. But... Um, Alistair, shall I let you do the last question? Yeah, so the final there. question from Angie Sadat is, is, is the obvious one, Chris. Have you looked at the SCN? So <laughs> her question is, is re realistically, is has the fetus lost its own endogenous rhythm because of destruction of the SCN? And that would explain uh, the the much cleaner heart rate rhythm. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, we haven't, unfortunately. Um it is something that we certainly should should look at doing. Of course, we were never um, we were looking at the brain injury on one hand, and then I was doing the physiological analysis on the other hand. Um, and of course, we never we never really intended to find such um, strange circadian outcomes. So the the two parallels the two parts of the work have gone off in different direction. But absolutely, I think it's something we need to. Um, get a better handle on what is actually happening at the SCN. Oh, yes, a great question. Uh, Eleanor, you, I see there's one. Oh, is there another question there? Um, uh, oh, actually, four, it's, not even a, it's not even a question. It's just a complimentary comment from, uh, Do, from oh. Dominique. Thank you. So I have, to, I have to tell everybody out loud in case they can't see the questions. Dominique Carella says, awesome, awesome, awesome presentation, exclamation mark. <laughs> which is so true so um can i ask Thank you one very more much. questions though because yeah because you're being bathed with confidence so i have to ask you a question now as well is <laughs> you mentioned hyperglycemia really briefly there and i'm really interested in that because of course and i know we always associate it with um babies who have sepsis and so on but it is a big worry and we always blame then which probably is the sepsis causing kind of white matter injury but is that, that combination do you think that um the hyperglycemia in itself we just need to kind of quickly control it with insulin just to make sure that they don't cause more neuronal damage yeah i think i think this is a um still an evolving story so i i did my hyperglycemia work back in well some of it started in 2014 and and back then there wasn't much literature around hyperglycemia there was a little mm. bit around whereas in the last couple of years um and the, yeah, so when I was seeing these terrible effects of hyperglycemia, there wasn't yeah. a lot in humans to say, yeah. yeah, it's also scary. So it wasn't, it kind of felt like I was yelling into a void for, for a little bit of time. <laughs> um, but now there's been increasing work, some of it coming from the Cool Cap study um, and from yeah. multiple other of the um, hyper hypothermia trials and other studies which have all sort of said hyperglycemia is associated with worse outcomes um and from my work i do believe that it's it is causal 
it's not just an association of a you know a stress response yeah. um triggering the hyperglycemia so yeah i i do think that hyperglycemia has been kind of overlooked for a fair bit of time um and yeah i i think and, it but it's still a evolving story and how do we best manage it exactly because then i wondering because i know from some of the cool cap work that you've and alistair have done looked at um the fluxes in glycemia being a huge problem rather than necessarily the hyperglycemia or the hypoglycemia and i'm just curious yep. about what you both think of that or yeah is it absolutely. just trying to keep it in, in and, normal glycemic yeah i i think you're entirely right it's it's both it's both the level and it's also um rapid fluxes in the, in the levels and rapid correction so i am aware that even in preterms where and um, studies done in in auckland by the liggins institute um where they've given to pre where they've given dextrose gel um to preterms to correct hypoglycemia mm -hmm. not in the in not in the setting of hi but when yeah. there was a rapid correction of um, glucose level, that was actually associated with worse outcomes. Which, oh, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I do think we do need to be very careful about how quickly we change. Okay. Um, yeah, how quickly we correct as well. Yeah. Um, but that's, you know, it's a really, really interesting area. And I suppose the thing is, what things can we correct in brain injury? And I think you, at least we can somehow control sugar. Mm -hmm. we think mm -hmm. you know so um it's yeah, really we, interesting we have a lot of experience in the rest of medicine controlling it so you know it's, yeah. yeah um so i mean i i i've taken too much chairperson privilege in asking questions so i'd better stop but i don't know if anyone else has any questions or if there's anything else coming up because i think your presentation was so complete you probably answered everything <laughs> hence all the compliments and um you you really covered everything it's really really interesting Thank you. Thank you. Very much Thank appreciate you. that. I don't know if, yeah, no, it's amazing. Alistair, I don't know if you have any last words to give us or do you want to? Uh, no, the, my only comment about the glucose flux story is we mm. should we, we do need to be quite cautious. Some of mm. what we're seeing is a reflection of the antecedent insult. Yes. That, that, that it's <clears throat> uh, the hypoglycemia reflects d the, an insult that depletes glycogen stores. Whereas the hyperglycemia is more likely to be associated with relatively acute insults, where glyc the glycogen stores have still have, mm. have, have have still been retained, and are therefore uh, the stress responses are able to to, to cause it. So we have a complex interaction between the type of insult and yes. the subsequent pattern of of hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia. And so, so it's a complicated story. And anyway, I'm I'm. It's totally the, these are totally empirical questions. They are totally answerable. We'll get yeah. there. It's fantastic. Yeah. Well, for me, thank you very much. I don't know, if, um, Alistair, we have any messages from the Newborn Brain Society that we need to share. Except uh, no, there's probably I, more you... compliments coming to you or something now. <laughs> They'll probably come well, privately by email. Ju Julie has already circulated the 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 the, fi the final things. So I can only thank everybody for attention. And I think we should we should we should wrap up now. That's fantastic. Look, thank you so much. Um, and thanks, Chris. And thanks, Alistair. It was amazing. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Bye. Thank, thank you again bye, for everyone. the opportunity to talk today. But bye, everyone. Bye. Record.